Well, I'm a performance artist. Um, I'm from Australia. Uh, presently, I'm at um, Curtin University as the director of the Alternate Anatomies Lab. So it's a new research lab. It's only go been going for about a year. And really, we're doing anything uh, related to the human body. Uh, novel prosthetic attachments, um, uh, disability studies, um, uh, um, interacting with um, uh, people who uh, have some kind of pathological condition. Um, so anything to do really with the human body. And in t not only in terms of the engin engineering of new interfaces, but also interrogating the ethics and the aesthetics of all this. Well, I, I guess it is interdisciplinary and, and incorporates a multiplicity of different media. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's really about engineering and prosthetics and robotics. Other times it's about uh, 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 virtual systems and how we can generate uh, actual virtual uh, performance possibilities. Um, so um, it's this kind of realm uh, that I like to explore where often what my intention is and what actually happens uh, is, is very different. In other words, really trying to explore the space between intentionality and actuality. And, um, and because I'm not an expert in all of these different area, specialised areas, uh, sometimes uh, there's collaborations with mechanical engineering, sometimes with um, IT and computer programming. Um, so this has been generally the approach that, uh, that I've taken, uh, really being open to possibilities uh, and trying to generate and actualise ideas that um, are a combination of very different special, uh, special uh, disciplines. Well, I, I guess it's, it's about uh, uh, being curious and uh, ex being experimental, uh, but also, of course, uh, because of my general interest on the kind of evolutionary architecture of the human body, and also, of course, um, insects and animals and how their different physiologies perceive and, and uh, become aware in the world, because of these sorts of general interests, um, most of these projects and performances are focused on physiologies, on, on, on anatomy, and not accepting the biological status quo. So why only have two hands or, or two ears on the side of your head? Uh, or uh, why do you have to locomote uh, with a bipedal gait? What does it mean to walk with six legs? So uh, it's these different kinds of uh, questions about the human body and not accepting the biological status quo that's important. Not only about operating in the world and becoming aware in the world, but also, of course, uh, questioning the very existence of the body and its longevity and whether this is meaningful. And, of course, we want to uh, authenticate our existence uh, upon a kind of Heideggerian death, but uh, to me the, this is no longer a meaningful way to approach the human body. And as we bioprint new organs, as we stem cell grow new body parts, as we develop more sophisticated prosthetic interfaces and implants, uh, then we can continuously repair malfunctioning bodies, uh, postpone uh, biological death. And anyway, now, most of us will no longer die biological deaths. We will die when our life support systems are switched off. <laughs> well, well I, think, I think it's this, this realization that there is now a, 
a possibility that all technology in the future uh, will be inside the human body. All technology in the future will be invisible uh, because it will be embedded in uh, the cellular uh, spaces, the internal spaces of the body. And of course, this has been the result of uh, not only micro miniaturization but nano scaling. So uh, at the moment, our human body uh, doesn't have any alert warning system that something is critically wrong at a cellular level. Uh, there's nothing to make us aware that something pathological is beginning to occur. Uh, by the time your, your wife uh, or your partner feels the lump in her chest, it's probably too late. Uh, the cancer has spread, the cancer might have already metastasized. Uh, so having nano-sized sensors that can detect pathological changes in chemistry, in temperature, blockages in the circulatory system, uh, means that uh, in, in effect, we need more surveillance in the future, but the surveillance should be inside the human body. <laughs> People are much more uh, comfortable now with the idea of implants or prosthetic attachments. And uh, whereas before a prosthesis might have attempted to be uh, a kind of a poor replica uh, a cosmetic uh, replica of a real hand with maybe a silicon cover over the mechanism, uh, people now are, are much more comfortable wearing uh, a, a prosthesis that is stainless steel, that is acrylic, that is uh, carbon fibre. Um, they're not so concerned about uh, purely uh, doing this uh, for cosmetic reasons. Uh, especially if that artificial hand is responsive, if it has uh, sophisticated functions, uh, if it has tactile feedback. Um, this is what's more important rather than uh, the appearance. Because anyway, it's, it's a little creepy. Uh, you know, you have this kind of uncanny valley uh, uh, effect in robotics and even in prosthetics where as you try to make a humanoid robot more and more real, at some point in time, it becomes somewhat creepy uh, to inter interact with um, because it's, it's, uh, it's uh, human, but it's not completely convincingly human. There might be a delay in the speech of the robot or there may be uh, a nervous twitch or there may, might be the sound of the motor uh, whirring in, in the robot body. There, there's something that turns uh, this uh, uh, robot, this humanoid robot, into a somewhat creepy, uncanny kind of uh, 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 system, interactive system. So this also happens with prosthetic devices, you know. If you try to make your prosthesis more and more real, uh, it kind of looks more and more, feels more and more creepy. So uh, even with my third hand, when I first made the third hand, it was in 1980, it was completed, I also made a silicon uh, cast of my real right hand to fit over the mechanism. I never used it because the mechanism itself was more interesting. I wanted to expose uh, the wiring. I wanted to expose the jointed structure of the hand. I wanted to expose the motors. The acrylic support uh, was uh, uh, transparent. So everything is, uh, is uh, operational and apparent. Uh, and, and I think this is, uh, people are much more comfortable now with this. And of course, we're, we're now experiencing people not only with kidney transplants, which makes no difference to my social interaction with you. If you or I have a kidney transplant, uh, I met the first double hand transplant patient in Paris about 12 years ago at a medical conference. 
it was very strange shaking the hand of a person whose hands were from a, a dead person. Uh, very strange. And, and now, of course, we're, we're doing face transplants. And very soon, there'll be head transplants. There's already the possibility of doing a head transplant or a body transplant, depending on how you, you look at it. Um, so uh, this really questions what a body is and what it means to be human. Um, we're now composed before we die, probably of some kind of artificial parts, whether it's an external prosthesis or an internal implant. Um, and then um, this, uh, this possibility of, of, uh, of a turbine heart, where we're inserting a heart into a person this device is more robust, more reliable, smaller than, an, uh, than any previous artificial heart, but it circulates the blood continuously with no pulsing. So again, you know, you might rest your head on your loved one's chest, they're warm to the touch, they're breathing, they're speaking, they're certainly alive, but they have no heartbeat. Um, we're now inserting uh, brain pacemakers um, for, for, uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, one, to, to control Parkinson's disease, where someone uncontrollably shaking. Uh, again, I, I met someone who, before the operation, couldn't dress himself, couldn't eat himself, because he was wildly shaking. And, uh, but with his brain implant, he was completely calm, completely normal, uh, could uh, perform all the, the functions that anyone else could. But once we start doing brain implants for surgical or medical reasons, it's not far from inserting brain implants for pleasurable reasons, for reasons other than medical or, 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 or cosmetic. or So there's a general acceptance, I think, of this. Uh, people are much more comfortable about the proximity and the intimacy uh, of uh, technology. And Marshall McLuhan had a very good definition of technology. Uh, technology for him was the external organs of the body. So we have evolved as a body with soft internal organs to function effectively in the world, but in a technological terrain, we have to engineer additional uh, 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 instruments and machines uh, to function uh, adequately. I mean, I've always uh, spoken of the body as an object rather than as a subject. Um, as an object, not of desire, but as an object for redesigning. But speaking about the body as an object uh, fits in to um, uh, this idea of a flat ontology, an object-oriented ontology, uh, which means that we take every object in the world, including bodies, animals, uh, cameras, uh, uh, cars, uh, hammers. We take all of these objects and we uh, uh, give them equal importance. So the body is only one object in a universe and an internet of things uh, in, in a universe of, of other objects, and uh, we, we operate and interact with all of these objects. Um, so a hammer is not a hammer unless a human picks it up and hits a nail. Um, uh, but we can look at it, you know, the other way around as well. So um, I like this idea of an object uh, ontology, uh, a flat ontology. Well, I kind of think it fits into the postmodern trajectory. Um, I mean, there's a, a fascination with animal studies now uh, because we're very interested in, 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 
in notions of, of the other, uh, not only in terms of the other human bodies, but also more radically um, uh, how insects and animals perceive and operate in the world. Um, so uh, I think this interest in the alien other, uh, whether it's an insect, an animal, a robot, and what does it mean for uh, a robot to have a certain phenomenology? Uh, you know, can we say that a robot uh, in a human-like way uh, experiences the world phenomenologically? I mean, if a robot can uh, sense data and, and sense various different kinds of stimuli and can respond appropriately and effectively, um, perhaps it can generate certain models of the world. Um, and this is, uh, I think, a, a, f a fascinating question. Um, on the one hand, yes, we can consider uh, everything equally uh, in an object-oriented ontology. Uh, on the other hand, we can question what kinds of phenomenologies these alien bodies, whether they're insects, animals, uh, or robots, uh, will, will, will have. Um, I mean, uh, I think what's important is not what's inside me or what's inside you, but rather what happens between us in the medium of language with, with, with uh, which we communicate, in the social institutions within which we operate, in the culture that we've been conditioned. At this point in time in our history, if we want to go back to, to Heidegger about being thrown into the world in, uh, at this particular point. Um, so. Uh, if a robot can make a facial expression that generates a, an empathy in you, um, if you feel sad when the robot feels sad, or uh, if I say something to the robot and it gets angry. Now, uh, one might say, oh, well, we're talking purely behaviorally. We're talking purely externally. Whether, whether this behaviour uh, can be uh, seen as purely external um, to me is, is, is meaningless because uh, if my actions and my words generate the appropriate responses from you, whether you're a robot or a human, uh, and the robot uh, responds to me uh, in, 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 a, in an appropriate way, then we're, we're having a communication, we're uh, producing a collaboration, and that's what's important. Um, so the more and more performances I do, the less and less I think I have a mind of my own, nor any mind at all in the traditional metaphysical sense. You're looking at a profoundly obsolete body but also an obsolete body that is uh, empty. There is nothing inside my head. There are no ideas and images inside my head. These ideas and images are only, uh, only occur, only become manifest with the lips that I speak, um, with the actions that, that, that I do, and the word I. Uh, this is a simple, uh, and convenient compression of a much more complex interaction of this body with other bodies in social institutions, in particular cultures. Uh, so we have to be careful that uh, in using language, we confuse our metaphors uh, with what actually is, is occurring. And to construct a mind or a self, or even to speak of consciousness, um, is only a convenience, a construct that enables us to simplistically speak about the world. Um, if I have to describe the infinite causal events 
that resulted in this person being here, uh, it would take too long. Uh, but if I say, I am an artist, I am here, this doesn't mean that there's something inside the body. This doesn't mean that there's an agent that asserts that this body is in a particular location. Uh, it's only meaningful in a very small frame of reference that is at this particular instance of time. Um, the reason this person is here is due to a number of causal events that have happened you know, over a long period of time. I've always been uneasy about this uh, art-science uh, paradigm, uh, partly because for me, uh, since art schools in Australia especially, were forced to amalgamate with universities, now art schools are part of universities, that the university doesn't know what to do with arts practice and in trying to authenticate uh, arts practice, they want to call it research. And uh, this to me is, is highly problematic. Um, and also, of course, uh, the university is more interested in published, uh, uh, published articles uh, in peer-reviewed journals rather than in performances or exhibitions. Uh, so this is the dilemma for me, and especially when this artist believes that it's in the making, it's in the process of, of doing art, of making art, uh, that one does unexpected and interesting things. You know, if you just have a blueprint for an artwork and you carry it out, uh, it's more of a craft than, than an art. Uh, I'm much more interested in practices that are, are conceptually driven, uh, practices that generate ambivalence, anxiety and uncertainty. And if you don't generate that kind of, uh, that kind of surprising, sometimes shocking, uh, perhaps messy, even pornographic, sometimes even dangerous, uh, aspects of art, then you're not uh, jolting the viewer out of their conventional aesthetics, out of their con conventional uh, uh, lifestyles. If art doesn't change anything, it's not interesting.